Welcome everyone tonight for being to be here. Um, I know it's freezing cold, so I hope you're all warm in your apartments. Um, we are hosting the I3 lecture series that SVA out of the Masters of Digital Photography program. And we're glad that you're all here tonight. We, I'm really excited that we have Andre Leroux here to speak to us. He's a Jamaican born photographer based in Brooklyn, New York. From his work as an Adobe creative resident, exploring stories across the country to working on the set of W. Camo Bell's United Shades, Andre seeks to, seeks to see the fundamental truth in each human being, regardless of background, culture, or upbringing. For him, portraiture is the archeologist's chisel, the biologist's microscope, the physicist's large hadron collider. So now without further ado, I want to introduce you to Andre Leroux. Hey, everybody. Oh, wow. Shout out to the, um, the clapping emoji for Marco. Um, let me start by saying, do you guys want to know how I met Stella? Just want to make sure that we're clear so nobody thinks that I'm like particularly cool or interesting. I was a temp at Shutterstock when I moved to New York City in 2014. I interviewed for that job on my birthday, August 15th. And my job was to email photographers to ask them to join their new premium collection offset. And Stella was the like, the pre like the, the photo editors, photo editor, and I, they just hired some young photographers who had some semblance of taste. And yeah, so every day I would sit and get eye strain and ask people if they wanted to join um, the stock photography thing. So um, as you listen to this, and I know you know this already, but y'all are, are all talented folks. I haven't seen your work yet, but I have great faith in not only your commitment to your work, um, especially taking class digitally, but also um, your commitment to each other. So remember that myself or anyone else that speaks to you, our only goal is to have you leave with a nugget or two that inspires you to keep making what you're doing. Nothing I'm showing is like, I need to do stuff like this guy. No, um, the focus, and I think what's something I'm gonna talk a lot about today is just understanding that what you have access to um, really determines your career. So just giving yourself as many access points as possible and be as excited and excited about it and as humble as you can will yield you good things. Stella can tell you I saw her every year at Photoville and sometimes around the city since then. And every year I was a little di little different, a little better. And now I have finally qualified to sit and talk to you guys about this. Um, I, I do want to call one thing out. I'm wearing this really cool t-shirt my friend uh, Ray Spears made. He's also a photographer. Um, and he also is a creative director over at Team, Team Epiphany. When you finish your uh, degree, that could mean that you could just have an amazing sense of art and can appreciate it throughout your life, or you become a commercial photographer or somewhere in between. So um, I just wanted to wear this and tell you that. So when we start, we can understand the stakes are high, but nothing bad will happen to you here. It is about expressing ourselves creatively. Anyway, with no further ado, I wanted to share... Um, my work with you. And I had this conversation with my partner um, a couple of days ago where she said, I don't know if you have any personal goals. And she said that was kind of sad. And I realized that's not necessarily true. I think so much of my work is fused with who I am. And to illustrate that more, I wanted to show you the short that I made last year with the iPhone in collaboration with Apple um, called Float. So instead of clicking it here, I'm actually going to go over a screen and play it on YouTube.
so yeah um i <laughs> my name is andre that is a short that i wrote last year um that was about a lot of things it was about my relationship with my mother i'm a only child of a single parent and so i know how what it's like when you know my mom has a little bit of time at the end of the day and our version of the beach was going to the museum of, of discovery and science um that was this really awesome place where you could like really like see science come to life you'd like play with nails and like do this thing where you could like talk to someone in a different room like learning the science of audiography and that was the thing we'd always do I remember being even a little kid immigrating from Jamaica and we'd like play there at these Power Ranger dolls and um, when I wrote Float I just remember thinking about how the beach has been really restorative to me during the pandemic and for the New York folks I think most of you are all of you um, all of those you know the train station was 4th 9th street the park was Fort Green, and then we filmed that at um, Fort Tilden, right? And so, you know, what you have access to is both what's important to you, or like what was important to me, and then also second, um, you know, what stories exist. So for me, I understand what it's like to wait a lot for a parent. And I wrote that and directed it to try to think about the idea of what it was like when my mom wasn't here anymore. Um, and so, yeah, that's a kind of a nutshell of my work. So, like I said, um, Brooklyn, like Stella said, that was an intro written by my good friend, my childhood friend, Lex, who is an talented writer. And as a gift, they wrote, gave me a, a bio, which was <laughs> kind of fun and awkward. Um, but yeah, I'm a Brooklyn based visual artist whose work explores the depths um, of intimacy and if actionable empathy can sustainably exist online. I know that all of you study your we will work endlessly, but I, I can't employ you enough to make sure you understand that you should be able to talk about your work in a 10 second interval, 15, 30, 60 second interval. Um, there are people that you'll bump into just for a moment. And I think that's kind of the magic of New York. Um, and really, you know, your work, my work and your work are vessels with which to have other folks feel something and for you to learn about yourselves. Um, and sometimes those things require capital and require resources and require subjects. And so being able to talk about yourself, um, although it's awkward, um, it's really valuable because it gives folks a good look into who you are and then they want to trust your work, sometimes the other way around. But yeah, and so what I mean by intimacy, if you look at this work, it, I try to make a lot of it feel like you're there. This photo um, of the two hands being held in front of the flowers, if anyone reads the Times a lot, I'm sure Stella does, but for the other folks, um, this was in the one year anniversary of um, the pandemic that the New York Times ran. And I keep that friend, it's so important to me. It's a photo of my um, baby cousin holding onto her older cousin's hand. And I just love the urgency with which she's tugging her, which I think is something that we can all relate to in this time. And the bottom left photo actually is from a tail fair show. The one time I photographed New York Fashion Week never again but it's really funny to look at it now because I didn't know that Telfair would be that like pop off to where it was um the top left is a photo I took on my phone um for Uber they did a, a partnership with the Guggenheim um just to show you that you know you can make stuff with whatever is available to you and then lastly the photo in the middle is a photo of my friend Sarah I took for a project I'm going to talk to you all about a little bit so why why intimacy why um is my hypothesis that like actionable empathy is important. And I actually think it's important for me to pause for a second and define that. Actionable empathy to me means that um, the people that follow me on Instagram, people that whether they know me or not, I can share a story with them and they might be relate, they might be able to, they might be able to relate to the story enough to have it have them take an action. So later I'm going to show you this um, anti-suicide project I did um, or this project I did with the North Face um, in Alaska with the Gwich'in tribe. And um, all those projects were centered on making beautiful things, but the, the beauty wasn't the final step. The final step was creating either greater knowledge for knowledge's sake or to action. And so I think it's really interesting that we're more connected than ever. Um, and so it gives us the ability to not just enc encourage folks to donate money or um, to show up to a show, but to like fundamentally change how they see women Black people, Asian, Asian American folks, trans folks, like actual empathy has like allowed us to creep art into things. And I think that's really cool. So it helps me when I'm 
like getting nervous about imposter syndrome because I can kind of settle on the idea that um, that it's less about me and more about the stories I get to tell. Another why for me is I was an only child. So I was always really excited when I got to hang out with people my age. I was like often for the folks that are immigrants. Um, I know you know this where you kind of just get dragged like someone well, your parents friend is in town from you know college or some part of Jamaica and it's hard to get to them so when they're in town we drop everything like drive like three hours to <laughs> see this person and like in that I spent a lot of time by myself and so you know I'd make up stories for myself but when I got to hang out with people that were my age that I got to choose it was always really exciting and I think photography early for me was an opportunity for me to capture those things um and so that idea of chosen family I embraced early on and was really interested in capturing folks with my camera early. So here is like a kind of a boring swath on purpose of my work, just to kind of give you all an example of like, I, I think that it's the responsibility of artists, not only to make beautiful things, but to just make accurate things that are about the time we're in. Um, the right, all the way on the right, the black and white skateboard is a photo I actually took with Apple um, on an iPhone. The top right photo is a photo, portrait of a woman who sang in the church I went to growing up. It was a story about um, her learning as a mother that uh, it's kind of hard to describe, but she has one child with special needs. And she said it took her a long time to realize that she could ask other folks for help. The uh, top right photo, it's actually pretty close, close to NYU's cam or to SVU's campus. So I'm sure y'all have been in this little corridor. And this was a photo, like an outtake of a photo I took for Headspace. Um, this bottom right one is a photo I took for CNN, actually about the largest black farm in America. And it seems silly because, you know, you want to get um, images of cowboys and all that stuff, you know, livestock. But I thought it was really cool to see this, take a portrait of the younger kids that all got to be on this farm. Because the question that the farm had going forward is who was going to take it over? Um, I was a journalism major, but I did take some photo classes. And I remember one of my teachers used to, always, used to always say like, whatever the action is, turn the camera around to see how folks are reacting to it. And then lastly, in the bottom left, we're gonna spend some time on this in a minute. There's a portrait um, that I took in collaboration with the Women's Prison Association for a project I did about sense of place. And I interviewed these two women that um, were formerly incarcerated to talk about what it was like to have that sense of place taken away from you um, and then have being able to have it restored later and how you cherish there or how you adjusted to that. Oh, so what space do I occupy? Um, I know some of you are gonna be fine art photographers, architecture, portraiture, um, food, flat lays, like there, there's an infinite number of things that you can work on. But I would just say that for me, um, I'm still surprised that I get to do this as a job. And so I often am not afraid of trying something new. I recently had a pitch call with a with an agency. It was the first one I ever worked with um, right after, I think I got fired from working as a tough. <laughs> Um, I worked with them to make some social media content. Years later, I got to pitch to them some current work. And I remember the creative director said, he was like, when I met you in 2015, you didn't know how to do a lot of things, but you were not afraid to figure it out. And I think that's an energy that I carry with me. So where, where do I sit? I think right between the editorial and the commercial space. I just wrapped a job over the weekend for Duolingo, the um, translating app. Um, I have a job next week for Camelback, the water, um, water bottle company. Um, and then the same end, I got to photograph something for the New York Times Tea Magazine on Monday. Um, and so I think that both have value. I think being a journalism major in college, working at the student paper, interning at newspapers, I, it was really nice to cut my teeth that way because I, I got to learn that like, I can't control everything, you know? Um, I, I can't control my lighting. I can't, um, I'm not exactly sure what situation I'm stepping into. And so I have to be all right with the fact that there will be, that there is change. But on the commercial side, I think a really valuable lesson is understanding. Once I understand I can't control everything, understanding what I can control and how I can get the best possible image out of what's available to me. Um, and so what that looks like is like, I do a lot of mixed light. 
um, for the Duolingo job, um, I know what we did was we placed subjects because we were trying to have them look like they were teachers and students. Um, and what we wanted them to do is feel comfortable enough, um, had them feel comfortable enough to make it look like that they were actually in a space that they would normally be in. So we placed them primarily in natural light spaces and then augmented um, you know, with Aperture 60, uh, 60Ds to get a nice hair light. And then sometimes we'd use um, this kind of laughably large um, sky panel just to give like a nice swath, like swath of uh, natural on the other side. But, you know, my style is constantly changing. I think that the editorial in me has just learned that everything has to kind of move with each client. Um, and so I would just encourage you uh, not to tether yourself to a style, but to um, a subject matter. And for mine, it's intimacy between people. So how did I get before you today? I mentioned that I used to temp, but I think it's important we go back a little. These are some of the first photos I ever took. Um, I, uh, <laughs> when I was in, in high school, um, I volunteered at church and there was a girl that I volunteered with. Uh, we were both like 14 or 15 together and her dad used to be a photographer. So he had like, I don't know, like may, maybe eight plus cameras and she had a crush on me. So she would let me borrow them all the time. And I would walk like a mile to these uh, Walgreens that was near my house. And I'd buy a film when it was buy one, get one, um, that Kodak um, gold, like 400. And I, that's how I learned photography, just like what shutter speed was, what aperture was. Um, and so these are photos from like random school trips and like friends playing piano or like birds in Florida. Um, and each time I got a little bit better. Um, and that's kind of like how it started. It started with my friend Kathleen lending me cameras, an older uh, teacher of mine. Um, he used to be a photography teacher. And after he saw that I was like always taking photos, he brought me this old Minolta 101, SRT 101 he had. And so I just started taking photos on school trips and was just always like trying to work through a role. Um, and I just, it always, I always really cherished that moment when I get the film back and get home and like figure out what I wanted to put up on this cork board I had in my bedroom. So yeah, first four for me was Mr. Tempest. Like I said, uh, Lee Tempest was his name. It was an excellent name for a drama teacher. If any of you are big fans of um, Shakespeare and Lee Tempest, uh, the end of Tempest was really helpful. He was a really, just a powerful man and really spoke with us about how to speak clearly about what we needed. Um, the learned lesson that I got really early when I was doing theater was that expressing myself like isn't a chore. Um, and so that to then have that person hand me a camera was super valuable. Um, so yearbooks, I was telling you all about, if we go back one, these all these photos ended up being in yearbooks that I made. I made a yearbook three out of four years when I was in high school because I thought the yearbooks that were there weren't that great. And so um, my first one was just like construction paper, like bound with twine. And then my mom was like, oh, this looks terrible. Let me give you some money. <laughs> and then I would buy bound books that like, um, we I put photos in and then one year I like, my friends and I like painted a bunch of the pages. So they all look different. And then folks would take it home and sign it or write in it. And I'd give them extra photos that I'd printed if people liked them. And I just kept all my negatives in this like giant binder that I think I used to use. I used to have Pokemon cards in if anyone remembers those. Um, and so that was like the way that I got into photography it was just all about like these intimate moments and like, um, holding them with me. So I could always not, not, not feel alone necessarily, but kind of remember these things that I felt like shaped me, especially at like 14 or 15, everything felt dramatic. Um, then when I went to college, I worked at my student paper. I worked in, at the independent Florida alligator, this newspaper for the university of Florida. And it was really helpful for me because I went from just like taking photos of my friends for fun to like University of Florida is a big school. Um, it's like NYU big. I think there's like 40 or I think there's like 60,000 students or something. And with that, there's, I went to school with NBA players, NFL players with um, people that are, were in the Trump administration, like people that work for Marco Rubio. So there was like an endless number of opportunities to like First, this first time I photographed politics were Senate meetings, photographing sports. Um, I remember photographing a silent dinner. There were so many like interesting jobs that I did there. 
um, different things that I got to go photograph. And that was just all, all, a lot of these photos are terrible. And there's a reason why I'm not showing you them now, but like that reactive nature um, that I got started there. Um, and then it manifests in other ways. So the last thing I have on this slide is graduating with no plan and no internship. So yeah, I graduated in 2013. I photographed um, a poster for the Alumni Association that they used on buses and in like students' bedrooms. And I didn't know what usage was then. And if you don't, please either DM me or ask someone <laughs> that teaches you. Um, and we can go over it afterward. If you're curious about usage, just write that to Stella. Um, but I think I did that whole job photographing editing, laying out all that stuff, and then having it be used all over campus for a whole year for $1,500, which was a huge deal to me because in my college town, my rent was $350 a month. So after I graduated, that $1,500 is what I used to pay for stuff while I was trying to figure it out. And I gave like towards the university. But essentially, um, I didn't know what I was doing or why, but I just knew it was time to graduate and didn't really have another plan. But with this slide, what the parallel I wanted to draw with my work was a project I did during my residency called Stories From Here. Um, during my residency with Adobe, um, I had the opportunity to make two or three projects throughout the year. And my biggest one was Stories From Here. It was about the question of um, sense of place. Like, how do we establish it? Um, and like I said earlier with Deborah um, and Keisha, spending time with them, um, in this home that they built for themselves after um, being incarcerated it was really powerful. So I just wanted to show you all a, a touch of that. So this is what it looks like. Um, this is my little thesis, how to set, has home frame identity, your ability to love, your ability to fear, your fear of displacement. Um, and so throughout this project, um, these were the last two um, and they actually ended up being published in Teen Vogue. Go away Teen Vogue. Um, and these like this piece that I'm very, very proud of where we get to publish their photos and their full stories about what it meant um, to parent from a distance. Like some of these were really hard to read. I remember that day I told myself that um, if someone says something that shocked me not to overreact, because if I let them know with my body that I was shocked, it might make them feel like they were otherwise and then less like, then thus less likely to tell me other things in the future. So a tip I would give you is just try to know your subject ahead of time. If they are seeking attention, then give it to them. If that's what you need in your photo, if they, you can get a lot as a photographer if you give your subject what they want or if you withhold it from them. Um, just something to keep in mind if you're trying to establish con conflict or contrast or, you know, just make people feel comfortable. The thing I wanted to settle on here was um, this is how we laid it out there. This is how the stories ended up being here. It was kind of a multimedia project it was primarily photography. Um, and this is when I first started to uh, play with actionable empathy. You can see like here, it links to the, the Women's Prison Association site with some more details. Um, but the thing that really stood out to me about this project was the, these are like the end projects, but a little earlier, um, these were all folks that I met, you know, traveling around the US. So these are people that either had moved or grown up there. Um, when I went to Texas, I did a swath of um, Austin, San Antonio, and El Paso. And I tried to only speak um, in San Antonio and El Paso to Mexican, Mexican American folks of various, whether they had just immigrated or been here, family been there for several generations, so that I could like get a better understanding. Um, Cause this was in 2017. So this was just fresh off of um, President Trump or Trump being elected president. Um, and so being able to talk about what it meant when folks talked about immigration or talked about things that, you know, they didn't really, whether or not they knew what they were talking about, the goal was to try to illuminate that. I remember talking to Cecilia, this lovely woman, um, about what it was like to raise her family and be a second or third generation Mexican American um, and that pride that she felt or getting to go to um, El Paso and meet, meet with uh, a congress, it's not a congressman, a city, a city councilman who took me all the way to the border and back. And then I got to interview him and talk about what he was doing to try to um, restore these like really sweet old tram lines that they had um, that would go to El, pa between El Paso um, and Juarez every day. So to take folks to and from work and that these were not only beautiful, but they were important because they showed that the partnership between the United States and Mexico has been strong for a long time, no matter what folks might say now. 
And so th this was a very journalistic project, but one that really started and was something I learned from in college that just showing up and letting folks tell you about themselves and, you know, not getting in the way. So um, after that, I, in the fall of 2013, or 20, yeah, 2013, I bumped into my friend, JR, who um, was an RA with me when I was an RA in college. And he was the uh, social media director for Groove Shark. Um, for the folks that know what that is, because it's kind of old now, it was right after Napster was like destroyed because, you know, they were doing Napster things. And right before Spotify really popped off, Groove Shark was how a ton of people would stream music for free online. Um, and there was the first place I learned that photography didn't just mean journalism stuff or like headshots and graduation photos. Um, there I was taking photos of bands um, when they performed. We were taking photos of products and par product partnerships they had. And I started to understand what a CTA was. Uh, for the folks that don't know, a CTA is a call to action. So if, if you're on Instagram and someone um, has like a, a story, they want you to click, their, click, in the, click the link in the bio or swipe up, um, the CTA is trying to get you to that. And generally companies have this thing called a funnel. And so the way a funnel works, uh, hold on. The way a funnel works is like the top of the funnel, um, they're just trying to get people in that are interested. So maybe Canon's trying to sell us all a new camera. And so the first thing they're just trying to figure out is a way to market to photographers in general. So maybe they might come to SVA. And then once they try to get you into their funnel with this wide net, and they're trying to move you further down until you do the action they want. And that sounds kind of weird, but generally that's kind of how we all operate. And I think I got a lot better as a photographer once I started to understand what a CTA was. Quick to jump down to the bottom, Walker and Company was a temp, or not a temp, was a tech company I worked at that made health and beauty products for people of color. And there I was a creative assistant. So I would, a creative associate. So I would write copy. I would um, like provide photos for layouts. I'd art direct stuff. And I started to like understand more holistically what my work was doing. And I think this was really helpful for me as a photographer because I started to understand like how my work existed in space and how it paired with other mediums. Um, and I think those lessons have still come with me today. So for example, um, when I moved to New York, like I said, I tempt with, well, not with Stella, Stella was an attempt, but I tempt. I was a photo assistant at Men's Fitness Magazine. I was taking pictures for this underwear company, Mac Weldon, for this backup company, State Bags. I would take pictures at parties. People always ask me now, like, how do you know you've made it? My only metric for if I've made it is that do I have to take photos at parties anymore? If the answer is no, then I'm happy. Um, but I think if the last little act I showed you, act one, which was high school and college, that was about learning to be reactive. This one was about being proactive. So it was about understanding that, you know, this photo of Jahari right here underneath um, the apartment building was, I was taking portraits of him, I had a plan. And in between, I took this photo I really loved. But I placed him in light that I knew would be good because I understood that we were in the middle of the day. He's a black man. He's very warm tones. And so if I placed him next to other sharp angles, it might actually be a more flattering photo than if I just had him out in the harsh shadows. The top right photo is from uh, this project I did called, called How to Shoot and Edit Darker Skin Tones. We'll talk about it in a minute, but that's just like a natural light portrait I took in a studio um, that I set up. And then lastly, this photo was um, from a McDonald's commercial that I worked on, a portrait of all the kids that we had in the scene where they're spraying water. But yeah, this whole period is just about starting to be less reactive. The end of it, Walker and Company is important because I got to work with um, my friend Mari Shibley, who's a creative director, and she would we'd had a ton of um, one on ones every week, and we'd have to go through our shoot plan. I had to scout, pull inspiration images. Sometimes I'd have to photograph things again, um, and understanding why I was doing it, what the CTA was, brought me to doing projects like Block from the Ballot. Black from the Ballot was a project I did um, with a studio called Paldar. And CTAs aren't always bad. I know I said getting people into funnels and making them make decisions and it sounds crappy, but um, Black from the Ballot was about how in Florida in 20, before 2018, if you had committed a felony of any kind, you could never vote again unless given special permission by the governor. Now, think about that for a second. <laughs> think about if there was a harsh drug penalty 
um, and you were found with any amount of drugs, think about if in some states or in Florida, if you are driving and someone else in your car has something, all of you can be indicted. And so it was a really fascinating way and pretty racist in my opinion um, that the state had really kind of disenfranchised many voters, over 6 million people um, across the US, but in Florida specifically, it was 1.4 million folks. Not only was it like a really awesome project, but it was a project that had a CTA. We photographed this over the summer in 2018 to gear up for election season. We ran these, these stories, like my friend uh, Kelsey and I went and interviewed folks, took their portraits, um, asked them about you know what it was like and what they're looking forward to when they get the opportunity to vote. I actually made a, we had a little video, but it was actually pretty bad. So I'm not gonna show it to y'all. Um, but these were just folks in their homes. There's nothing particularly beautiful about it. But as a larger story, I understood what my role was, right? Some of these photos, like this is just like of a guy. But um, the goal is that anytime someone comes to the site, it works well with this graphic design that's set to look like a ballot um, versus I think these photos of LaBelle are my, my favorite photos. But, you know, he's a pastor now and photographing him um, in this space and the idea of forgiveness, because that's what it was called. Um, the bill is being sold as the second chances bill. Um, understanding what the CTA was and what I was trying to do, it made me feel like I was a part of something that I was really proud of. I wonder if this is still here. Yeah, it is. Okay. Well, yeah. So this was an example of like how CTAs work because we just encourage folks to vote yes on this bill to give folks the opportunity to vote again. Um, and the photography was a key part of that. Taking, taking like a larger look at this, like if the first one is, um, reactive and the second one is um oh just lost my train of thought excuse me if the first slide was about me being more reactive and being able to um look at what's around me and make something out of that mud the second one was about um how to make a plan and how to execute it and this last one is about taking what's around me and using that to make um work that tells stories that i'm proud of and really every experience is like it's an important lesson. So when I attempt, it helped me grow taste. I had to look at people's work over and over again. I was having to look at like hundreds of portfolios a day and decide what was good or bad about them. If you go to my website, you'll see it's actually pretty whatever. <laughs> I have to update it. But um, my process was really honed with a lot of that boring stuff. I think often folks are like, oh, no. Like I, I talked to my friend's class at NYU a couple months ago. And one of the students was like, is it bad that I like have to get a, a part-time job? And I was like, no. <laughs> Your goal is to be able to express yourself, whether that's for one one story once or through an entire career. Um, you you learn in school is your is the observational and executional skills to recognize art and create it. But what you do with that is really up to you. Um, when I was at Men's Fitness, uh, you know I watched a lot of anime, right? But when I was there, the other thing I did was I used to have to like kind of organize and collate the budgets for photo shoots and like walk them over um, to get approved by the photo director. And that was the first time I started to see how big budgets were made, what you did to, um, what you did, like how much it costs to make a, a photo shoot, a, like a cover shoot. Um, and like understanding that I had a baseline for like, you know, even if I'm not trying to make, I'm not gonna have a $50,000 budget that just the effort of it, like I'm being paid for more than taking the photo. It's like my taste my ability to work quickly, all that stuff. So really every experience is a lesson. Then um, kind of last little set here. Um, I did my residency with Adobe. Um, that's still available. Y'all are welcome to do that. Essentially you work for a year, Adobe pays you. And then they also help you cover your project costs on a project that you pitch. Um, for me, I did stories from here. I also did um, a project called how to shoot and edit darker skin tones um, that we're gonna talk about in a minute but it was really centered around the concept of me being tired of seeing bad photos of non-white people. I'm just like seeing photos that are overly orange or overly whitened of Asian women, photos of um, black folks looking too green or too blue, um, really people not understanding skin tones and then also not using hair lights, like little things that could be helpful that you know are subtle ways that reinf we reinforce white supremacy by showing folks images that aren't right and that someone didn't care to fix. 
um, after that, I got an agent. Um, he felt like I had known him from before, but he saw my work during the residency and it was actually very helpful um, for him to kind of see things I could work on. This photo we're looking at now is actually a photo I took for Lululemon in, 20, in 2020. This was my first big shoot um, in COVID. I remember being so nervous, but that was the thing I got through my agent. Darling Street is the name of my company. Um, which is funny, Tinker Street, Darling Street. Darling Street is named after the street my grandfather worked on and the sugar mill factory in Jamaica. Um, and then lastly, Float and Directing, which I um, showed y'all. The, the interesting part about that is I feel like I'm like learning, like the, the advice I'm trying to give you mixed in with work of mine is, um, is something I'm taking to heart now as I'm trying to direct more things. Like I'm almost just trying to get my hands on any piece of video storytelling I can so that I can get used to continuing to understand how motion impacts mood and putting folks in a good position um, to act and be special, you know? I think putting it all together, this is one of the best examples of how I've used my work in the past. Um, I went to the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge um, with the North Face in 2018 or 19, I also can't remember now um and made this website that as a cta lets you take action now but also i should let this sit it's called the last expanse so first on the reactive sense i got to with a couple other folks be dropped in the arctic national wildlife refuge we spent time at with the Gwich'in folks at um at fort yukon they gave us some salmon they'd save they saved for us we spent some time with them just kind of understanding what life is like and why we should not allow oil companies to drill in the refuge, not only because it's their home, but, but because it impacts the entire planet. So it was a human interest story and, and a story about the environment mixed together. And then I had this idea after Quibi launched, remember Quibi? <laughs> um, that I, we could try to make a microsite about this that taught folks about um, the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge in seven minutes or less. Linked to some Times articles, had some additional photography, but as they're working, you have the CTA. So if people get to the website through Instagram, through social, they're in my funnel and the funnel then pushes them to call their senators to oppose this bill that actually was opposed or to, they, to support this bill to um, repeal the provision of tax billing. And it just kind of had like, you know, how you can help, why you should care. Um, and then further in here, some kind of stories from here-esque um, captures of the folks we met there and then a little bit about what we saw. And it was, I think the word, the team, the, <clears throat> the name The Last Expanse came from the idea that we didn't want to use the words untouched because then it had a colonialist mindset with The Last Expanse, the idea of this open area that we haven't perverted um, was one that was really powerful. I'm really proud of this project. We actually had a book and did a show in DC where we um, had sold some books and sold some prints. Actually, I think we sold all the prints um, and all that money went back to the Gwich'in Steering Committee so they could continue to raise awareness. And we got to meet with senators, which was so cool. Uh, this was probably one of the coolest things I ever did. Um, we, my work was on an iPad, we gave senators books and then we just brought the work up and um, a couple of the Gwich'in folks talked about it. And if any of you are big fans of the Met Gala or fashion, I just remembered this. Um, I can actually just show you on mine. Um, one of the Gwich'in folks that I photographed that's a friend of mine is, I didn't really, like, I thought this was so wild when it happened. Um, but I just brought it up. I just thought of it and I thought you guys would want to know is... Quana chasing horse. And if you remember who that is, shout out. But yeah, this is Quana when we went to the refuge. And it's super funny because now she's like an international supermodel, <laughs> which is so awesome. I'm so excited for her. Um, but yeah, I got to um, photograph her. And now it's amazing because she's everywhere. She just did this um, thing for, uh, oh my God, what's Rihanna's thing? I can't remember. Savage Fenty. Um, but the photo that I think everyone knows is this one when she went to the Met Gala. And it was just so wild because I saw this photo and I was like, oh my God, that's Kwana. Anyway, let me finish this up. So um, Darker Skin Tones piece 
This one was kind of funny little throwaway. I wrote an article when I was a resident with Adobe that essentially gave some photography basics, um, but talked about things that you wanted to pay attention to if you're photographing um, black and brown folks, if you don't know them, um, and you don't come in contact with folks enough as we try to march toward a, more, toward a more equitable future. It's important that photographers can photograph people, all sorts of people well, children, black folks, brown folks, um, Asian American folks, like every opportunity we can to be good um, stewards of the image, I think we should. And so this, that was the project idea. And it's funny because now whenever I write about it or whenever someone takes a bad photo of a black celebrity, someone will tag my article or like, I have like this little baby viral Twitter thread about it, which is super funny. Um, this actually isn't a photo from it. This is a photo from the Times last year of this amazing painter, Toyin, you should like her work. Um, something I do every year is I photograph um, W. Kamau Bell. He is a professional comedian. He has a TV show on CNN called United Shades of America. And last year, this really cool thing happened. Um, they used my photos for, a, for the commercial for his show. And it's only 30 seconds I wanted to share with y'all. Conversations. Some are hard. Some are easy. Sometimes you talk. Sometimes you listen. Sometimes you agree. And sometimes you don't. Conversations can create change. Let's talk. A new season of United Shades of America with W. Kamau Bell premieres May 2nd at 10 on CNN. That was amazing. It's one of the weirdest things ever when they, they reached out to ask me to re-edit the photos because they're going to run in a commercial. And I was like, what? Um, usage is also helpful. Just a note for that. But a um, couple quick tips for y'all running out of this. Building your brand and your business. Um, some of you are already established photographers. Some of you have been in school a long time. Some of you are both. Um, make sure that your personal projects, um, they express something that's important to you, but push you creatively so that you can show a new style or piece of work um because sometimes folks especially commercial folks rarely want to take a chance actually editorial folks too and they're probably even worse about this they rarely want to take a chance if they haven't seen you do it before often you get hired for something you've done many times in the past because people don't want to take chances that could um yield some difficult things for them um and so these are all different branded things i did cnn with kamal top rights actually from a job with uber um, the photo with the woman with the red uh, flower in her hair it was for a new Lightroom um, editing tool that um, was just helping you better understand skin tones and color. And the last one was a portrait of a black barbershop I did when I worked at Walker and Company. Um, so kind of further on that, Adobe is the one I'm going to use here. Like, I'm a firm believer that everyone you meet whether it's for work or not, has something to give you, something to offer you. And so you have to make sure that people not only feel seen and heard by what you say, um, but that you, you follow that up. So um, reaching out with emails, reach like a lot of the things I do now are the result of the fact that I used to take photos of people that are now creative directors, right? I'm 30, I'm not super old, but I think often folks just need a, a way in. And sometimes that way in are, is, the people you meet, like everyone you meet has value. Um, and so try to treat them with kindness and be consistent, follow up and try a lot of things so that when your time is called, whether you want to be a fashion photographer and you want to work with Telfair, like, you know, whatever is around you, whatever things you have access to, like that's what you need to be photographing. Um, working with clients, um, especially if it's a client you're photographing like this middle photo, if anyone likes sports, this is, um, oh my God, I forgot his name. <laughs> He is a quarterback, Tyrod Taylor. Um, photographing him for Fashion Week for Bleach Report was really awesome. And you want folks to feel confident um, that when they're with you, that you have their best interests at heart. Um, this is a photo I put it in later from the um, largest black farm. So I wanted y'all to see. And then um, almost at the end here, uh, just getting an agent. Uh, if you feel like you want to get an agent, I would tell you that you should be comfortable with someone taking part of your money. If it's um, if it's something that you think will be helpful for you, like if this person gives you access to new clients and new um, like 
two pillars of business, great. But if not, you don't need it. And I think that's it. So I'm going to stop sharing because I think I've talked about myself enough. Um, and I'm going to help you with questions. Or if not, maybe just kick me out. Um, Tom looks like he's ready to do that. Not at, not at all. Not at all. So if you have a question or you want to make a comment, please put it in the chat box um, and point it to me so that I can read them out to Andre. So I'd like to ask a question. What are you up to these days? What are you working on right now? Well, I got went to DMV today. That's a pretty big deal. Oh, yes. um, yeah. uh, no. Um, OK, so first, I'm actually trying to take, my, take care of myself a little bit better. I, did a, I directed a job with the Colorectal Cancer Alliance last month that's out now um, that's basically about how colon cancer is super pre preventable, but it's the second leading uh, cause of death um, for folks. And so after that, I was like, oh, I need to like go to the doctor more. So this last like month, I've been like all the appointments and checkups and trying to take care of myself. So that's like a quick note, please do that. Um, right now, um, I'm trying, I have like these two ideas for shorts that I wanna make, um, not like similar to float in that they are shorts, but not similar to them at all. One is um, I did this project in college that was really like, eh, that I should redo. Um, there's a CDC statistic that when I first did the project in 2011 was that African-American kids are three and a half more times likely to drown than white kids in pools. And after they revisited that in 2018, it went up to five and a half more times likely. So I have um, an idea for a project that is CTA heavy and helpful, but also a little dramatic and um, like two to three minutes. And then I have another idea for a short, oh, hey, New York. Um, I have another idea for a short called Firstborn. Um, that I want to do with my friend Isabel Lopez about a young Mexican-American girl that wants to do her quinceanera early to uh, signify that she's the new matriarch as to her mom dies. Okay. Wow. And then other photo stuff. But those are the two things that are at the top of my brain. So you got them. Okay, great. Know, IDK. Um, Jack Lee asks, how does your photography inform your directing, if at all, and vice versa? Okay. When I was an intern at Group Shark, that's a great question. Um, I assisted the video, their video guy a lot. And I remember he said this thing to me, I will never forget it. He said, I could leave you to set up any scene and you will do a great job, but you do not understand how motion impacts mood. And I was like, oh, well, well all right then. Um, and it, it really stood out to me because he was right. I didn't really understand, like once the camera starts moving in a direction, like what does it mean? When should it be handheld? And so first I think that like, um, my life got easier when I started using more continuous lights for photography because I'm using continuous lighting a sometimes it can help the subject because they kind of know what they're going to look like before the flash it's less hot and then using those using continuous lights made it easier for me when I was using them for videography um, for the folks that it, I'm sure you understand this but I'll just say it um, you strobes don't work when you're um, filming a video because they flash like for single moments and then they you know you need something that can continuously give you light evenly throughout so as you move through the scene it's not you're not getting drop off of, drop like drops or fallout or anything like that so it informs it um because it has like i understand what i want it to look like i can set the scene up and then often i'll spend some time like taking different takes that are just slightly different motions so I want to know if this is if this feels how I want it to feel I know how I want it to look but now I like then the question I have once motion starts is like how do I want it to feel and then on the vice versa I think that there are some folks like um, my friend Paula who are these really really amazing photographers who really have like this cinematic style so sometimes sometimes I try to um, have a photo that feels like you are in a singular moment. I wasn't my photos to feel close, but sometimes ha like attempting ones now that feel more um, cinematic is something that I'm continuing to focus on. I hope that answered your question, Jack. Okay, if it didn't, you can ask a follow-up. Um, Shari Goodfriend wants to say, she has two questions. Was that Denzel Washington in the very first photo you showed? I mean, I have no photos of Denzel, but I wanna know what okay. photo it was. Okay. Oh, no, but it does look like him. That is a photo of my friend, um, 
who lives in Harlem and is a very lovely uh, menswear designer. Okay. The second question is, how do you market yourself now in the age of COVID when so many people are not in the office to receive cards or take meetings, look at work? Or do you just have enough uh, contacts now that people read your emails? No, people don't read my emails. I, they do, but... Um, okay, so a good example. I, um, I am... I got this advice from my friend Eric a couple of years ago and I'll never forget it. He audits his social media followers. He like will frequently just like scroll through, read bio, see who they are. And if they do anything interesting or have interesting things, he'll just introduce himself. And I've been doing that for a long time. And so now, like I said, like, or even like doing things like this, going to stuff, even digital things, like you're really just looking for opportunities to introduce yourself to people. A lot, like sadly, most of us can do the same things and so it's really a question of trust like I've never been like a big cards guy um so something I do is every time I do a job I will write a thank you card I don't send like postcard work um but I try every time I do a job I said thank you card float was cool because a lot of people saw it I actually did a big job for a bank earlier this year um and the art director didn't have me bid at all he just said I saw this a couple of my friends saw it. I thought it was beautiful and I want you to photograph this so a, like figuring out ways to have folks see your work. Um, cards is a, is one way to do it. Um, you can also, if it's a company you really want to work at, like finding finding folks on the internet and just following them, being like a quiet participant for a while is helpful. Sometimes immediately bombarding somebody um, can be really frustrating, especially like let's say, if they say, they say well, let's say they work at Nike or SVA or something. Often folks, it'll come off as you're like, I want to work at Nike and you seem like my end versus how can I, how can you, how can we be collaborators together to get what you want and what I want? Um, and so, you know, the other thing is like, often if I'll pitch like cold pitch, I'll try to include things like specific things that are, is work that the, that that person has shown to like or has worked on. Or sometimes I will just be like, this thing you did inspired me in this, this way. But auditing the people is really helpful because you'd be surprised. Sometimes people just follow you because they think your work is cool. And then you just DM them. Like someone yesterday I did this. Someone followed me from a brand that I like a lot and I've worked with before. Or not worked with, I use all the time. And I just DM them. I was like, hey. And they were like, oh, hey, someone at this agency had just shown me their work. I thought it was awesome. And I was like, let's please uh, do a Zoom call. Um, and if you're, if you're not as COVID... Um, a fearful as I am taking meetings is helpful. Um, but I wouldn't like hold yourself back and be like, I don't have a, a print portfolio. I don't have this stuff. Like really you're trying to, people are trying to find out like, can you execute the thing that my vision for this? So you spend time figuring out what their vision is and then spend time like showing them that you can execute on it. And if you don't get th that person, then they're just the practice of doing that is helpful. If you do enough decks, you'll realize that most decks are almost the same. There's just like, maybe eight different conclusions that people can draw from. So maybe for me, it's like editorial looking commercial work or it's like like high fashion, um, black or brown folks. Like, so I kind of end up having work in similar veins. And then from there, um, I just hope that they choose me, but often folks say no. I don't get the impression that a lot of people say yes to me. Slightly more than before, but it's not like over 50%, it's like 30. Do you find people tend to find you more on, on Instagram than through your website? No, um, I don't even know who finds my website. I would say that LinkedIn and Twitter are actually great. Um, mm -hmm. Instagram is interesting because I, I find it's like a nice way to support um, other people. And often if I need a photographer, like as a BTS person, or I can't do something, that's how I look for people. But I'm not sure, like, I, oh, another thing is anybody that hires you, ask them where they saw your work. That is the, like, you know, when you like go to ZocDoc or uh, I don't know, Amazon or Best Buy or B&H and they'll be like, where did you hear about this product? Like that's them figuring out how they can spend their marketing dollars better. For you, it's just trying to figure out like if folks saw my work here, I went to an SVA gallery, then you have to be like, okay, how can I, um, how can I go back to this place so I can engage with people more? Um, I don't know. I, when I ask folks, like now I feel like after 2020, I got put on a lot of lists you know, those useless lists where they were like, how are these black people? But later, um, 
that so I, I had a client reach out the other day that I didn't end up working with, but they were like, oh, I saw your list. There's an agency that we work with that designs our websites. And they had like a post about like their favorite photographers and you happen to be on it. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what goes back to like, no one is unhelpful. Like when I work with like these celebrity stuff, I promise you like a lot of times like those PAs and stuff are super helpful because they are people that the, that the celebrity is cool with and it's just kind of like a transitive property thing. And so just try your best to be as kind of folks as possible. Don't be weird about taking any job unless it like is harming someone or is directly against your values. Take it if you need the money and then just try to make sure anyone that works on it with you knows um, that you value them being there and you're appreciative because a lot of times those people end up being decision makers. It takes a while, but mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, um, let's see. Shari just wants to say that she thinks you're amazing and she sent you a DM. Oh, thanks. I appreciate that. You should, you should definitely respond to her. She's a terrific photographer. Nice. Um, any, anyone else? Do we have any more questions or comments? What have you, what is there that you want to do that you haven't done? I mean, other than ideas of things you want to do, is there something in particular? Because um, you've, you've gone from still into, into video. Um, is there anything, are you looking to be a full-time filmmaker? You want to do docs or is the answer yes to all of that? Probably yes to all that. My like goals. Okay. I'm going to say this out because this is the internet. So someone will see it. I yeah. want to direct a TV a, episode for television okay. before the end of 2024. Okay. Um, I want to, um, one of my, my friends have been joking that I'm going to direct a Marvel film. I, that's not going to happen, Oof. but it would be very not. And that's not good or bad. No, no, no. Things mm -hmm. are important. Just not, you know, no, no judgment. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think I still want to do, if I could, I'd still do like 40, 50% photography. But I think the thing that kind of excites me about video, especially like I've just used work to cope during the pandemic. It's probably not great, but whatever. Um, it has given me the opportunity to spend time with people I care about in a way that's safe. Like we're all tested and it's just a little bit better. And so sometimes it's cool when you work on like video, like film or TV or anything, because you can work with folks um, and really form a bond as you work on something and then you kind of ship off and watch um, kind of bloom into something else. And so it's always exciting because like, it's just a, an interesting way to problem solve. Um, and so I think that, I think that's really exciting on the, on the photography side. I want to keep making cool stuff, like cool stuff. I think changes in definition. There's a organization I work with every year called to write Lovender arms. That's an anti-suicide organization. And so this year they just emailed me yesterday to ask like what we wanted to do for their, like, they have like a big fundraiser every year where they raise money to um, get folks therapy or get folks counseling or like immediate emergency help. And so this year I was telling them like, Hey, I want to make like a short, but I also want to make some informational stuff. That's like how to have a difficult conversation or how to identify when you need help. And like, that stuff's boring, but like, it's important, right? Like um, I've been trying, I think this year to like figure out, the way to make things that aren't only for my own vanity <laughs> and just like that are helpful and like beautiful. And I think those things will keep manifesting um, if I try really hard and people, and I try to be as good to people as they have been to me. Can I ask you to put a link to that organization into the chat? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I think that'd be really helpful. Um, Tom, want, Tom thanks you and says that was a really thoughtful talk and appreciate your lessons that you can learn from any experience in your career. What was the most surprising lesson you learned? Is this Tom the- This is Tom, yes. Wow. Yes. Wow, I mean, I mean, wow, that's, I feel, I feel very special. Um, <laughs> let me, you let are. me get this link and then I will- um, Okay. <laughs> and then I will answer Tom's question before I forget. Just in case anyone wants to check out the organization for any reason or see, see past work that Andre has done because you, you seem to have a really interesting and good balance between, you know, sort of um, in a sense, giving back through organizations and things that you believe in as well as commercial clients, personal work. It seems like you have a really nice balance with that. I try. You okay, know, I try so that's now in the chat, in the chat box, if you wanna see it. Okay, Tom said what? What, what? was the most surprising lesson you learned? 
Um, because you said that you can learn from any, any experience that you have, which I totally agree with. That I don't need to be in charge all the time. Mm -hmm. I, um, one of the examples is like working on the TV show. Mm -hmm. If any of you have photographed stills for anything, you know that nobody cares about you at all. <laughs> they're like, if you even breathe the wrong way, they're going to kick you off the set. But I think some of the best work I've ever had has been um, working on on sets because sometimes I think like, if I thought about what I'd want my uh, superpower to be, sometimes I think it'd be like super speed or sometimes I think it'd be invisibility because there's like a beauty in being a photographer in an undis an, like a capturing something in an undisturbed space. Um, and what I mean by that is like, I can find this for y'all. There were some really beautiful moments I've gotten to photograph for the show, like people that um, have like really powerful stories, like here. Like this, these were some more of the photos from the like largest black farm in America. There were these like just really stunning sunsets and like animals and you just saw like what it was like all the pride and work that these folks had and they had this like giant family dinner this is only like a third of the people <laughs> because they had all left at this point but like wow. just understanding that like sometimes like i'm there and my job is just to be there um it's not to try to make anything crazy um stuff can be art by itself just like okay oh and then in 2020 for black people we don't have to die for our stories to be important that's the other important lesson. You just, you can just make stuff and it can be dope and you know what, I got to kill you for it to um, have value for people to like want to look at it. Mm -hmm. A heavy lesson, very heavy lesson. Um, I'm just looking to see if there are any more comments. I want to really thank you, Andre, because you've given you, I really like the way that you've pulled it together in terms of your personal, your personal lessons, your evolving career. I mean, when I knew you, I was, I was a freelancer, so I wasn't on staff there either, just so you know. Um, and, they, and they canned me as well. So Yeah. Yeah, so there we are. Um, <laughs> um, but I really appreciate it. And I appreciate the fact that I've seen the arc of your career so far. And I, I'm really excited for you and what you've been doing. So thank you so much for coming and being agreeable to speak in front of the class. Oh, and totally. The and anybody else have anything that they want to ask or comment on or anything? Hello? Yeah, okay. turn your cameras on if you want. Um, let me say, um, Tom, Sarah, Stella, Marco, like it's eight o'clock and you guys are still working, right? Um, and no, I'm not, I'm not trying to be funny. Like that's not a small thing. Stella, especially, you know how many people bother this woman all the time? I've seen Stella at Photoville. She's like a, <laughs> people are chasing her and she'd always stop and say, Hey to me. When I had my first photo printed at Photoville, she was so sweet about it. Anytime she just like sent me these like really lovely messages and that those things were important. Like I, there's a ton of tiny kindness moments that I've had with you and all folks all around New York. Um, she is the best. Stella is the best. But Tom, you're also very lovely. Um, and I just, yeah, I just want to say thank you to y'all. Like, it's a big deal. Like, institutions are important because they, whether or not they mean to, they validate work and people. Um, mm -hmm. And some some random person is going to think I'm important now because I spoke at SVA. But for me, <laughs> it is being validated by someone who I respect a lot and I've worked with before. This vampire man that's next to me over here being Marco. and um, <laughs> And, you know, Tom and Sarah for like all the work that they do. So um, I hope not only that I can come back, but that um, for you folks and anyone here that we can like sit and chat in a non-COVID environment and feel good about it. Yes. Well, thanks so much for your time, Andre. I'm going to be emailing you about something. So look out for it. Great. Um, and I'm just thrilled. Thank you so much for talking. And everyone else says thank you as well. Yeah. Um, you can search my name on the internet if you want to find me. Um, last thing I wanted to point out, I have a Discord that's been really helpful for if anyone knows what that is. It is a like a it's like a it's a 
group chat. It's like a visual art community group chat. Yeah. And I basically decided to stop answering DMs of the same question all the time. Um, and so here are all the links to things. Um, if there's something that I talked about that you want to learn more about, I have some stuff on YouTube, um, which is lazy, but not that lazy. Um, and Discord's great because there's other professionals in there that are all doing really awesome things. Um, and it's like really cool. We have like a feedback server and stuff. Um, well, if you take you. a moment and check those things out, I completely forgot about it until just now. Um, but yeah. And then just also while you're in school, like be cool with the people you work with. There's, you know, someone, I was not the best <laughs> photojournalism student. So you never know how things go turn out. And life is long. I could be, I could end up being very bad again. So thank you, everybody. Uh, say that about all of us. Thanks for all of that.